Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for your patience. Um, please welcome our speakers for this afternoon, Professor Mary Beard and the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament, Ken McIntosh, MSP. What a fantastic reception. I, can I say, I don't think any MSP has ever been greeted that way <laughs> in the chamber. Uh, my name's Ken McIntosh. I'm the presiding officer here at Hollywood and delighted to welcome you uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much for coming along to the Festival of Politics 2018. Uh, this is our 14th uh, year and uh, this is our, uh, our final day, but it's been a great success. Thanks to you, because it's a participative event. It's all about your engagement uh, with politics and with public policy, your chance to give us your thoughts and your questions. And today is no exception uh, with our guest, Mary Beard. Before we, I go on to introduce Mary, um, I want to thank, first of all, the Open University, who are the sponsors of today's event. And they've been a big supporter of us throughout this week and sponsored several events. Uh, and they've made this event uh, possible uh, this afternoon. We're also broadcasting live on Facebook, Facebook Live. So for those of you who are social media savvy, I know that Professor Beard is very social media savvy. <laughs> We're on hashtag FOP2018, hashtag Festival of Politics 2018. Uh, so, I'd like to welcome Professor Mary Beard, and I'd like to give kind of a little bit of introduction. Uh, I think, actually, from the reaction, people do know you, but if, for, the, for those who don't, uh, Dame Mary Beard is a professor of classics at Newnham College, Cambridge, and classics editor at the Times Literary Supplement. Born in Shropshire, the family relocated to Shrewsbury when Professor Beard was young and she attended Shrewsbury High School on a scholarship where she swiftly became a star pupil. She was particularly gifted at Latin and Greek, often completing all the terms homework in the first week and... <laughs> exactly, yes. Yeah. And in her summer holidays, participated in local archaeological digs. In 1972, she took the entrance exam and applied for a place at Newnham College Cambridge, and since then became a classics lecturer at King's College London, then moving back to Newham College in 1984 as a fellow, at the time the only female lecturer in the faculty. Her first book was published in 1985, Rome in the Late Republic, praised as an accessible and innovative account of Rome's transformation into an empire. In 1989, whilst raising her children Zoe and Raphael, uh, and working, she published her only non-history book, The Good Working Mother's Guide, a series of hints and tips for working mothers. In 1992, she was appointed classics editor of the Times Literary Supplement, a post she continues to hold, and in 2004, Mary became professor of classics at Newnham College. Her breakthrough to, in public consciousness was probably the book Pompeii, and it was read by the controller of BBC Two who offered Professor Beard the opportunity to present it as a TV documentary. And since that, that launch pad, the learned but very approachable Professor Beard can be seen on TV translating Latin transcriptions, carving up pizza to explain the divisions of the Roman Empire, or arguing about public services on question time. Her book, Women in Power, was a runaway bestseller on both sides of the Atlantic, and one of her most recent television appearances has been as the, one of the presenters of Civilizations, the big budget BBC version of Kenneth Clark's uh, 1969 series. She is regularly flagged down by fans, and one admirer published a poem titled, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be Mary Beard, <laughs> which now adorns T-shirts worn by her legions of fans. And she has many friends in high places, including Hillary Clinton and the shoe designer Manolo Blahnik. Professor Beard writes a blog called A Dawn's Life for the Times Literary Supplement. She is known for being very active on Twitter, responding to critics and trolls with reason and optimism. She sees this as a, a big part of her public role as an academic. Professor Beard was made an OBE in 2013 and a Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2018, both of her services to classical scholarship. She lives in Cambridge with her husband, Robin Sinclair Cormac, a fellow classicist and art historian, 
has two children who are also academics. I'm delighted to welcome Dame Mary Beale. Thank you very much now for joining us, thank, Mary. Thank you. Can, can I just say the reason I did all my homework in the first week of term yes. was because I wanted to get up to no good in the other weeks. <laughs> yes. and the, the, so if you, if you had a real blitz at it, a binge homework session, yeah. you then could go out doing things you shouldn't for the rest of the yes. time. Uh, I like that, <laughs> that mischievous streak too, which I think comes out in all your work. Well, but it is, I think, probably worth starting just there to explain how you got into the classics, because it's not even, you know, for, for very bright uh, children, as you clearly were, it's not an obvious uh, interest. How did it, what inspired you? I mean, those kind of questions are always difficult. You know, they're always difficult to give a true answer, but the answer that makes most sense to me and, the, and what I remember goes back to when I was five, actually, and my mum, who is a school teacher in Shropshire, thought I ought to go to London to see um, the capital. And we went to London, and she was a teacher, and so we did some fun things, and we also did some educational things, and we went to the British Museum. And there were two things I remember about that, which were, I think were absolutely formative for me. Because, first of all, we went to see the Parthenon marbles, and whatever you think about where the Parthenon marbles really belong, I was just, when I saw them, gobsmacked. I just thought, I kind of got the impression when I was a kid uh, that somehow humanity had been sort of a series of progresses and that if you went back a very long time, people weren't so good at doing things as we were. And to discover that two and a half thousand years ago, you know, they're actually better than us, was, I just, I remember that kind of jolting me in some ways. But the thing that really, really got me in this visit to the British Museum was, um, I wanted to see the Egyptians, partly that was the mummies, but I also wanted to see Egyptian everyday life, or my mum had convinced me that I did. And there was one case where she could see, and it was, it was the old days in the British Museum, and so that it was certainly not child-friendly. You know? um, and she convinced me that, um, that, and she was right, that at the very back of this case, there was a piece of, I think, 4,000-year-old carbonised Egyptian cake. Right? And that, that, I think, you know, there's not many five-year-olds that wouldn't find the idea of a 5,000, 5, 4,000-year-old piece of cake kind of intriguing, but it was right at the back. And I, I was quite big, and she was trying to lift me up to this high case to see, uh, not very successfully. When a guy walked past, I've got no idea who he was. He, he must have been a keeper at the British Museum. Uh, he saw what was going on. He came over. He unlocked the case. And he said, what did I want to see? And I said, I wanted to see the cake. And he got the cake out of the case and put it right in front of me. And what I think was amazing about that was uh, not just that the cake was fascinating, and it's still there, I can tell you, so I've been to see it, um, it's that this guy, I just, the message that that guy conveyed, which was people will open cases for you, people will help you understand the past, and this might be right at the back of the case, but people will be nice and they will introduce you to it, um, you know, eyeball to eyeball. I think that somehow struck as a kind of political message in part, um, even though I didn't quite realise it at the time. But, but it has, I mean, that, that has been your approach to history, or certainly the programmes that you, you make for, for the public. It's about the accessibility, and it's often about the detail about what people eat, you know, or, or where they went to the toilet, actually, quite often. Yeah, you, <laughs> you, can, you can always get a load of kids interested by showing them a Roman lavatory, you yeah, know, yeah, sure, and then you right. say, and do you know they didn't use paper, they used a sponge on a stick, and that's, you know, at that point, you've got them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I can't, you know, looking back, one of the things that I'm trying to do in these tele programs, I think, is do what that bloke did for me. And to say, hey, look, it's interesting, 
you, you, metaphorically at least, even if you can't do it literally, want to open museum cases and make, make sure that people get to enjoy what's inside them and think about it. And often, it isn't rocket science. When people think that, you know, archaeologists, historians, you know, they have all these technical skills in looking at these objects that, you know, ordinary people don't have. Well, you know, there is some technical skill. I wouldn't deny that. But very often, you know, history is a game that we can all play. Uh, our questions are, are good questions. And, you know, we don't, we don't need to have got a degree in Roman archaeology to start to kind of engage with that. And that seems to me very important. I'm often, because television programmes take a very long time to make, uh, and there's a lot of hanging around, I sit and I watch visitors go round Pompeii, for example. You know, ordinary visitors, whether with guides or not. And what always strikes me is that when they're looking, when they're really concentrating, almost all the questions that they raise are really good ones. You know, I can't see where the water goes here. You know, is that where a window was? And you think, but often they'd be made to feel that their questions are just, you know, they're just kind of amateur questions. And I want to make help people to think that their questions are largely, you know, the right ones, and they can have a go answering them. So I'm, I'm struck, and we'll, we'll return to some of these issues about accessibility, but the, I'm struck by the fact that... Uh, how much you do, so you, you're, how busy you are generally. So you're making these TV programmes, you're active on Twitter and so on, but you're, you've got a, a, a daytime job as a, 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 as a scholar and a lecturer. Uh, have you always enjoyed that part of it? I mean, that's hard work, and I know you're, I think you're famous for the hard work, but do you enjoy it? Yeah, I mean, that, that's my day job. And I think, well, you know about telly, you have to be realistic about television. You know, the, um, you get picked up, you're the flavour of the month, every year or so, maybe five years, maybe ten years, but in the end, they'll get fed up with you. You know, that's just the law of telly, I think. Like so unless, <laughs> yes, David Attenborough is probably the only living exception <laughs> of this. Um, and, you know, I think always, you know, first and foremost, I'm an uh, academic who works on the history of mostly ancient Rome, but also in part ancient Greece. Yeah, I've got great students. I really like the job. Uh, I really like writing about that in a highly academic way. I've written some really, really boring stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> and the other, the other bit is kind of, a, it's, a, it's a lovely optional extra. And I'm hugely relieved that I didn't get into television until I was in my mid-50s, you know, because I think it would have been, it would have just been awful to be a young person, you know, you know and you, you know, your eyes, you know, you, you would have, it would have gone to your head, you know. I mean, I think of it as, you know, kind of quirky extra thing that I do, and it's fun, and, you know, there is a, a sense in which it, it, it's nice to get what you think and your ideas out to, you know, a wider audience than a few hundred undergraduates, but it's, it's, it's not me. I mean, when all this is gone, I shall be in the university library in Cambridge writing extremely boring things and being very happy here. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, you, you, feel, you don't feel the need to prove yourself in any way. You've, you have proved yourself as an academic, and TV is the icing on the cake. Yeah, I, you know, I guess so. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think telly, in part, was proving I could do it. Mm. You know, and I have learnt, I have learnt a hell of a lot. I mean, I used to think that it would be perfectly fine to do a programme on Pompeii in which he just went round, you know, a few houses, um, never got outside the city of Pompeii, uh, or possibly went to see a museum. And, you know, the first director I worked with said, that if, if you never get out of this town, your viewers will have switched off, right? You know, you, you, and so I've learned a bit about how you put things over visually. And you mentioned the pizza, you know, in one of our programmes, um, we did try to um, encapsulate the nature of the, uh, of the disaggregation of the Roman Empire by cutting up a pizza. But it took so long that the pizza was inordinately difficult to pull apart um, by the time we finished it. Um, interestingly about that, you know, people, people remember that, yeah. I 
it was the idea of my producer. And I'd said, yeah. we, look, sorry, that's so naff, you know. <laughs> that is, I am not going to, you know, I'm just not. And so she's very patient and she let me have a go explaining to camera mm -hmm. the, the nature of the disaggregation of the Roman Empire. And, you know, after a few attempts at this, I had to agree, it was so dreadful. Bring me the pizza. <laughs> I said, all right, let's do the pizza. Uh, and, <laughs> and we did. You know, so there are things like that yeah. that you are always learning. Mm. And we'll, we'll, we'll come back to history, particularly the, your most recent book, in a second. But sticking with TV, um, one of the most, uh, I suppose, uh, I'm not sure it was life-changing moments, was uh, when you went on TV and A.E. Uh, e. Gill, the critic of the... Well, I think people might know the story, but he's the, the TV critic of the Daily Mail. Sunday and, Times. Sunday Times. Sunday oh, Times. Oh, right. So, but he had a, he, he, he had a right go at you. He had an and amazing go at me. But you had a right go back. Yeah, it was after... He had a little go at me after my first television programme on Pompeii, a minor go. And then he really went to town uh, when we did a, a series, Meet the Romans, about everyday life in the Roman Empire afterwards. And it was kind of, you know, she looks, you know, 16 from behind, but 65 from the front... Um, how dare she think that she can come into our living rooms without having made herself look presentable? I mean, those teeth, that hair. I mean, it, it just went on and on and on. Now, I laugh about it now. And, you know, when you actually pick up the paper, um, or in fact, I read it first online, and you read that about yourself, you think, blimey. You know, she said she should be on the undateables. <laughs> and I thought, but it took me a kind of, you know, 30 minutes or so to think, I oh, can on, be it. This is just stupid, you know. This is, I mean, this is sexist, it's ageist, and it's just not very intelligent. It's not very clever. So actually, paradoxically, the Daily Mail was part of um, my defence because uh, loads of people in the media picked this up. And it, interestingly, it... it turned out that Gill was not with the trend, really. There must have been some people, I'm sure there still are some people who think, can't she do something better with her hair? Um, but I, I did two things. I, I, I went on Woman's Hour, I think, and I did an article in the Daily Mail. And I thought, just saying, look, come on, you know, we're, we're not judging historians on telly by, you know, what their teeth look like, you know. Um, and I was really, really fearful that the Daily Mail audience would, and readership would, would be rather with Gill than with me. And there were some, but by and large, all those comments under the line in the Daily Mail, which are usually so absolutely ghastly, um, they were mostly on my side. And I, what I suddenly realised was that, um, that the Daily Mail's readership was actually women of my age who didn't like this idiot mm. saying, saying that about somebody mm. who they felt they were, they were kind of the co-evil of. And when I said, a bit they really liked, I said something like, look, just get real. You know, just look at me. I was in about 56. This is what a 56-year-old woman actually looks like, you know, if she hasn't had work done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. let's, let's just accept that. Yeah. And in, in some ways, this was nothing to do with me, really. It was, it was a bit of a turning point, because people, you know, although... <laughs> one reporter, one television critic in the um, Sunday Times about civilizations tried to kind of ape A.A. A. Gill to not much success. And people don't really say that now. Um, you know, we know there's all kinds of trouble about, um, you know, women on television, women getting paid the same, older women on television, or whatever. But they don't do that. And I'm pleased to say that A.A. A. Gill had his Wikipedia page hacked and had nasty things put in to it. And um, that was sort of... I, it wasn't me, you know, it was somebody else. I wouldn't know how to hack a wiki page. Um, so uh, it, was, it was a learning experience for us all. Well, indeed, and, and 
you, I mean, a, a rather nasty experience for you to, for you to uh, under, endure. But I think people warmed to that, the idea of you standing up so robustly in, in the face of that attack. Because I think people would recognise that kind of attack and how unfair it is, but it's the fact that you stood up. And you did very similarly, you did so online with, when you went on Newsnight, I think, 2013, and you were just defending immigrants. Yes. So you, you, were, you were saying, you know, come on, these people make I, a contribution. I was slightly naive then, because I think I would know now that if we were to go on Newsnight and to defend immigration, you, you might feel that that was a very important thing to do, but you'd know there would be, you get yeah. attacked. And I, so, I didn't. I didn't that, expect it. That's right. And so, but you were really aware. But again, it was the, is because this, and, and politicians, and female politicians in particular, will, will recognise this. <laughs> You don't just get attacked, you get, you know, it's, it's misogynistic, it is vicious, it's sexual, you know, and, and it's, it's very aggressive. Yes. Um, but you didn't, again, you didn't, it's not just that you didn't buckle, which is, or, but you didn't ignore it either. You then took them on mm -hmm. and you responded, and you responded politely yes, to the point that I believe that one of the young men who um, had been attacking you, I mean, I was reading this, and just uh, absolutely remarkable. You, you, you sort of challenged his thoughts. He responded, and you ended up getting to know him, and you ended up becoming a referee yes. for him and applying for a job. Yes. I, I mean, yes, it's, it's astounding. It's, it's very funny. Um, I, I mean, I suppose, you know, I've realised two, several things, actually, about how you, quote, deal with this. One is, when you get attacked online, the standard advice is don't reply, block them, move on. And, and I, I wouldn't want to say that my solution works for everybody. And I think if you're, if you're working online, you have to find your own way of dealing with this. But I thought, look, this is just telling me to shut up. You know, somebody says all that rubbish about me. And the advice I'm given is to say nothing. It'd be kind of like saying, well, you know, let the bullies stay in charge of the playground and let the bullied, you know, take them, you know, away from the swings and give them to the bullies. That's not what I'm going to do. So I, I kind of felt very strongly that I felt better if I replied. And I learned that it was extremely advisable to be polite. You know, if ever you're on Twitter and you think you are about to be rude, Stop it, you know, because it only goes to the bad. You know, that it's the slippery slope. And I also kind of thought that some of these people who were writing that kind of stuff, and it, you know, bits of it, were, you know, were awful. You know, they took, you know, really graphic images of female genitalia and put it over my face and that kind of stuff. Um, some of those guys, I think, are nasty, but m many of them are lonely, drunk disinhibited, um, and the one that I wrote reference for certainly fell into that category because he, um, he put this stuff up. Um, it's about, I think, again, what, what my genitalia might smell like, I think, was the burden of it. And I, I said something like, would you please take that down? You know, no reply. <laughs> and it had two stages, this story, because the first stage was somebody tweeting, I know his mum, she'll get him to take it down. <laughs> <laughs> Which indeed I think she did. <laughs> and then there was a kind of bit of good news story, you know, if you want to stop the Twitter trolls, just get on their, onto their mums and that's, yeah. that's fine, you know. Um, then, you know, because the Daily Mail so far, and what I've had to say, has had quite a good press. Then the bad side of the Daily Mail came out because they got onto this story and they tracked this kid down. Um, and they had a picture of his house. You know, how it, he'd been on holiday with his mates and too much lager had been consumed. And, you know, it was a nasty thing to do, but, you know, when you're, you know, 18 or 19, you sometimes do very stupid things yeah. and nasty things. And so it had a second wave where they went for him. Then he applied for a job and he was first offered it. And then they Googled him and they found all this stuff and everything that the Daily Mail had, had uh, raked up. And I said, and he, uh, they withdrew the offer. And, I, and he told me about this because by that stage he'd come to Cambridge and apologized and we were in contact. Uh, and I said, look, I will write, you know, 
the only person who can tell these people that you apologised, as far as I'm concerned, it is over, move on. It's the only person who can say that is me. So on that occasion, I, I did write, but they said, no, we're still not going to give them the job. I then said to him, look, I better just write you a reference, because you're not going to be able to conceal this. And I am the one person who can explain what you did, explain how it was resolved, that you had been brave enough to come and apologise and to say that, you know, this was now, you know, it, as far as everybody was concerned in the past. And he has now got a job. But all is all right. Phew. That's, uh, that's, I, I think we, we might return to that because it's a, it's a particularly live political issue, and particularly for, for, for women in politics and how to, how to deal yeah. with Twitter trolls. But if I can, can I just turn to your book, just... Um, this is a, a, a fa fantastic book, I have to say. And it's very short. It is indeed, you got this, yes, I know. <laughs> and in fact, I think Mary will be signing copies afterwards, so uh, just for information. Um, but the key That's here... That's a plug. Yeah, you got yes, yes. <laughs> the key here, though, is that... Um, and we'll come on to the, the, the position of women in society. You've talked already about um, older women on TV, the absence of older women on TV and the reaction they get. But the point here is that you trace attitudes, misogynistic attitudes to women back centuries. Mm. And you talk about the, the, the culture, the structures of society that keep this way. Yeah. Can you just introduce for, for, for our audience, just, um, you know, you start off with a great example of how yes. women have been told to shut up. Yeah, I mean, uh, the book originated in lectures. Uh, two lectures I did in the British Museum for the London Review of Books. Uh, they have a winter lecture series, they always find it, actually, find it quite difficult to get women to agree to do it. I said, yeah, OK. Um, and it was a topic that I didn't pick myself. You know, it's very easy to agree to give lectures. And then you know, six months later, they say, what's your title going to be? And you say, haven't the clue, you know? And then they press you more and more, and they, they say, look, we've got to get a title because we've got to get our publicity out. So I said to the editor of the magazine, what do you want me to talk about? You, you choose the title. And good literary editors are really wonderful because the, the mark of the really good literary editor is that they know what you'd be good at talking about and they know what you want to talk about, even if you've not quite realised it. And so she said, and it's the start of the book, I think you ought to talk about the public voice of women. Right, I thought, OK, that's the title. And of course, she was very smart and I did see that somehow all kinds of issues about the woman's voice have been something that I've been thinking about for ages, but not sort of crystallising as a subject. And it was, what I was really pleased about was that it was a subject that, that could enable me to link what I did in the day job, really, um, study of the ancient world, and often the study of gender relations in the ancient world, with now. And uh, I put two things at the very beginning of the book really came together for me. One was a little scene at the very beginning of Homer's Odyssey, 8th century BC, you know, the second oldest work of um, Western literature. And as many of you, I'm sure, know, the Odyssey is a story which has the end of the Trojan War, the Greeks have, have beat Troy, but the Greek heroes... Uh, are having a very hard time getting home, and we follow partly the story of Odysseus, who wants to get home to his wife, Penelope. It takes him ten years, and um, an awful lot of women intervene between <laughs> Odysseus and his wife, it has to be said. Um, but also, it's the story of Penelope waiting for him back at home, and her slightly, at the beginning, wet behind the ears teenage son, Telemachus. And there's one bit at the very, in the first book of the Odyssey, which I must have read, what, you know, 20 times? And I'd never really noticed. Um, and it's a little moment, it's just a few lines long, when Penelope is up in her room, she's doing her weaving, she comes downstairs in, in the palace at Ithaca, and she finds the bard singing a terribly gloomy song about what terrible time the Greek heroes are having in trying to get back home. And she says, quite reasonably, could you please play something a little bit more cheerful, right? 
At which point, this wet behind the ears teenager says, shut up, mother, speech is man's business, go back to your room. And she does. Right. Now I thought, gosh, you know, I looked at it in the context of this woman's voice issue. I looked at it and I thought, that's the first time we have any recorded evidence of something that has happened ever after in throughout the world of a, of a bloke, and in this case a rather kind of weedy bloke, telling this savvy woman to shut up, right? And I thought, that is how I'm going to uh, open this lecture. You know, because somehow all those, all those occasions in which women have been silenced, in a sense, go back to that. And I joined it to a wonderful cartoon that was in Punch, I think in the 60s or 70s, uh, which is a scene that every single woman I know recognised, where there's a meeting is going on, and there's a man in the chair, and there's about six or seven blokes around the table, and one woman, and the woman's name is Miss Triggs, and she's obviously just made a good suggestion. And the chair of the meeting is saying to her, that's a very good suggestion, Miss Triggs. Would one of the men like to make it now? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know any woman that that doesn't actually play to. And it's the same story as Odysseus, Telemachus and Penelope. And you, and you make a couple of political observations too, um, talking about modern day politics in particular, um, about Mrs Thatcher, about having to lower her voice, her register. Uh, and then about the treatment that Diane Abbott received yeah. compared to the treatment that Boris Johnson yeah. received at yeah. apparent gaffes. Yes. When, you, when you start to look at that and you think about how women's voices are heard and what the reaction to them, often, you know, well, I think very clearly on radio, um, you do start to see that the, that kind of issue that the voice of authority is still thought to be the voice of a man, continues. And that was very, very clear in the case of Thatcher, who famously, uh, when she went to kind of training courses in self-presentation, um, was told to lo lower her voice. And if you go on to Google and you look at the early videos of Thatcher and the later videos of Thatcher, you see that instantly. That's what is... That is what has happened. And uh, women who go on leadership courses now are told to do exactly the same. And you know, because we don't hear the voice of a woman as a voice of knowledge or authority. And that came over very clearly to me in just before and just after the last general election. And added to the point that we have higher standards for women in politics than we do for men, and we judge them differently, and we never let them fail. And there was two interviews that were, one was, I think, on L LBC, but the other was on the Today programme. And they were both politicians making a real mess of it. One was Diane Abbott, who hadn't got her maths remotely straight about what police pay would amount to. Uh, and the other was Boris Johnson, who didn't have the foggiest clue what his party's policy was on something. And when you looked at how... There were total car crash radio interviews in both cases. Diane Abbott, the reaction to it was, you, you know, you are not fit for public office. You know, that is... Now, actually, the interview was just before the election, and she did get re-elected with an increased majority. But the... The, kind of, the, the commentariat just rounded on her uh, to say that that shows that, you know, get, get, get out of our government. Boris, and it's interesting that we call him Boris, you know, well, it's very... Um, it's affectionate, isn't it? It's affectionate, you know. Uh, he, well, he had the kind of, oh, tut tut, Boris, next time be a bit more on, be a bit more on top of your brief. You know, it was a kind of naughty schoolboy being told to do his prep better, you know, but not being told, you know, you are not fit for public office. And I, mean, I think throughout this, you can see, I mean, if you look, for example, at what happened to Hillary Clinton and the email server, 
You know, I'm sure Hillary Clinton was not sensible to have used whatever email server that she used. She wasn't the only politician to have done that. And it becomes a kind of a, a hanging offence. And sticking with Diane Abbott, I'm just conscious that of all the women in politics, she attracts more aggressive attacks on Twitter and social media generally than anybody else. I mean, is it... I mean, you, you famously respond to these people, but is, it, is, it, is that actually even possible for someone like Diane Abbott? She gets thousands of these uh, horrible, offensive... Yeah, uh, I think it's, you know, and she, you know, she's both female and she's black. Mm. You know, and I think that um, a, the, the double whammy there means that she gets, you know, she gets worse than I get because she's kind of, she's compounded her crimes, not just being a woman, but being a black woman. Mm. And I noticed it actually when she, we were uh, direct contemporaries in the same year uh, when we were undergraduates at Cambridge. We didn't know each other very well. But she'd found a, 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 you know, our undergraduate matriculation photograph. And she'd kind of, she, she just, she did a good humoured tweet where she kind of had sort of circled her and circled me and said, you know, you know, just to ha basically haven't we done well? Um, you know, go back all those years, would we ever have imagined yeah. that life would have, you know, and the shit she got for that. Mm. You know, you privileged, and you think, mm. look, you know, she wasn't, she was like, you know, she isn't. Mm. Um, we were both the first people in our families to get a degree. You know, we're not, we're not, um, you know, we're people who education has made, mm. not who are, uh, took advantage of education because we were already privileged. Mm. And, you know, I just thought, heavens. But it's the, the idea, though, that, that, that women like that are not allowed to speak in public. And the theme of your book is that it's not just they're not allowed to speak in public, but they're subject to um, quite, well, in historical terms, vicious uh, ways of silencing them. Yeah, I mean, you have your, uh, your heads chopped off, basically. Um, I. Tons cut out. Tons yeah. cut out. I, I became very interested, actually, in how um, the Twitter trolls, not just in the, that they were abusing me, but how, what, what were they picking on? And quite often it was, I'm going to come and cut your tongue out. Now, it, eventually it struck me that really what was at issue here was not that I had said something... Um, unpopular about immigration is that that I had spoken at all. What, what, what Twitter trolls are trying to do is not say, I disagree with you on this particular issue, which they may or may not do. They're saying, I don't want you to speak at all. I'm going to cut your head off and rape it. I'm going to cut your tongue out. And those tropes, of course, go back to Again, back to the ancient world itself. You go back into Greco-Roman mythology, you know, and you find the story of Philomela, who is raped by this nasty king, Tereus. And what does he do to her? He cuts her tongue out so she can't denounce him. Now, there is a... Uh, hard to say there's a happy ending to this story, because there isn't, but uh, Philomela is resourceful, and she weaves the story of the rape into her tapestry. So she, um, in, in a sense, she finds another way to speak. And Shakespeare then takes that up in Titus Andronicus, and he has Lavinia being raped, and, uh, and her rapist there, who knows the story of Philomela and the tapestry, um, cuts her tongue out and chops her hands off. You know, she still manages to speak. She puts a, a twig in her mouth and she writes the story in the ground in the dust. But it's always about stopping the women speaking at all in stories. And, so, you know, and they're stories that are part and parcel of our culture. And we want to go on. You know, I don't want to say we shouldn't watch Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus because it shows a woman um, being punished for being raped. Um, I'm just saying we should have our eyes open to what's going on. Mm. But it does alert us to things that need to change. And, um, Catch my eye at this point. If anybody wants to come in and ask questions or make little points, just try and uh, put your hand up so I can see you and we'll pass a microphone around on front of your desk. Um, but we are, I mean, we, we, here we are, 2018, so it's 100 years since um, women's suffrage was introduced for some women in, uh, in, in this country. Um, but this is also the year that's seen the Me Too movement mm. 
Yeah. Now, is, is that, does that depress you, frustrate you, or encourage you? That, pro that uh, lack of progress. Partly, I think, uh, we, uh, I, I feel, and my mother felt, that we, she had, and I am now still, living through a revolution. I feel um, my mum was born before women had, any women had the vote in general elections, and she died having seen a female prime minister. And even though it was a female prime minister she had no time for whatsoever, she did at least think it was... You know, there had, you know, it was a change to celebrate, and you know, I feel that. I mean, when, when I was growing up, uh, something like 4% of women, uh, uh, of Westminster MPs were female. Now it's just over 30%. You know, um, that's still not necessarily good enough, but you know, I feel I live in a different world. I feel that when I look at... Um, well, Westminster Parliament, the Scottish Parliament. I mean, I feel that it's that for all the disadvantages, it's not just men in suits. You know, when I was a kid, it was basically men in suits and Barbara Castle and Margaret Thatcher. Um, and so, you know, I, I can do the optimistic story. But then you come to something like me too, and you know, part of me again is whatever the terrible allegations are that lie behind that, you know, I partly feel celebratory that women have really used social media as a way of speaking out, that, um, that you know, it's, it's been impossible not to hear some of the voices of women over the last uh, 12 months. My, my question is, what, what's the trajectory of Me Too? And you know, how do you turn a hashtag into a kind of social change? And I mean, I think it's far too it's far too early to say. Uh, and you know, I have two entirely different predictions here. One is we'll look back to um, the end of 2017, 2018, and we'll say that was the start of a revolution, another revolution about what women sh should be able to do and what they should not have to put up with. Not just women uh, in the rather glamorous bits of the film industry, but you know, women in the office, women in the, on the factory floor, women beside the photocopier, in the schools and universities. You know, that however kind of tortuous the path might be, that was the moment we'll look at. And that's what I hope. I also kind of think that there is a possibility that even if things don't ever go back quite to what they were before, that there'll be a fizzle here. And, and if you were to say, why might there be a fizzle? It's because if you think that that sort of abuse of women is about the differential power structure, then actually what's going to change that is not a hashtag, it's going to be changing the power structure. And, you know, if you look at the statistics for who is powerful in the film industry, just to name one, and you think that something like 10% of the directors of big Hollywood movies are female. Now, if, if you're going to actually make women's, I'm not, saying, not just about women's careers, but if you're going to provide a proper place for women in the film industry, you've got to change that. You've got, you've got to do more than say me too. You've got to change that structure. We'll see. But it, so you, you're encouraged by it, but, but a lot more needs to happen there. I've got a question right here. Yes. yes your microphone will come on in a second. There oh, you right, come on okay. now. <clears throat> Chris Muirhead. I'm a psychiatric abuse survivor, an unwaged carer, campaigner, blogger, writer, and an agitator. I want to say that there are a lot of strong women probably that were behind the men that were strong. And I'm thinking of John Knox and probably his mother was there. I'm thinking of all these statues of men, and I'm thinking of Scotland here because I had a lot of strong women in my family. We weren't academics. My mother was a psychiatric survivor and she survived much ECT and various other uh, forced drugging. 
And there was a great example to me of uh, surviving despite all that and being very productive because she externalised her mental distress. I think in Scotland, historically, we have very strong women. It goes right back to Pictish times where women did actually, there was a matriarchal mm. line, as far as I'm aware. So I think historically in Scotland, we are strong. I feel that I'm a strong woman. I chose who I wanted to marry. And he said, yes. And before that, <laughs> his mother asked me if I would marry him. <laughs> and that's Scottish folk. And I think, you know, he married me again when I asked him in 2002, because I'd divorced him before that. But <laughs> I, the reason being, I was again having to voluntarily go into a psychiatric ward. And I think he's really good because he's anti-psychiatry. I needed him. But we're separated again because we can't really go on. You know, it's okay. just... He was useful and he's quite happy. He's a father of my three sons and they're, they're all psychiatric survivors also. There are different ways of being strong and I, being I, powerful. I, I, a good point. Can I, can I put that just anyway, to Mary? Yeah. Just because I think the, the excellent story and about uh, your life there, but it's also, the, start off with the point about the visibility of these strong women in society. Because the statues, we're, we've, everyone's commented upon this recently, all the statues, the public statues in Scotland, are men. I mean, I, I think in terms of strong women, you know, that it may be one of, one of the several things that Scotland does better than England, I think, a sense of strong women. But it, I think for me, the, the, the issue is not whether there have been or are strong women, because, I'm, you know, women are immensely resilient, tough, strong in all kinds of ways. Um, it's the issue of whether you see them, and it's the issue of whether you hear them, and it's also the issue whether they get a chance to change the world. Uh, and, you know, historically, you know, for, you know, historically, I think they've often told their menfolk what to do. But, uh, but I think a lot of us think that, you know, being the power behind the throne is not what we want to be. I want to be the power on the throne, not behind it. And that's the difficulty. What, as, as an historian, what do you think about the, the move, that, very iconoclastic, to, to smash all these statues, bring them down? I mean, do, do you approve or do you disapprove? or what, what, How do you see that? I think it's a really tricky one because, you know, again, I'm such a bloody academic, I'm sorry, I've always got, I've always got two you answers see. which are diametrically opposed, <laughs> right? One is I, I... That's like a politician, by uh, the way. <laughs> I, you know, to, to take you know, statues of, oh, uh, let's say university benefactors who profited from the slave trade, something like that. Um, I worry that removing those statues partly lets us off the hook. I, I mean, what, I, what I want to do is I want to say, you did give this university a lot of money, and we are now looking you in the eye because we've got to accept where that money came from. We've got, we've got to see it by removing you. By, you know, you, we, we can somehow turn a blind eye to where the cash came from. I was in Oxford quite recently, and they have a very notorious example of this, a guy called Codrington, who made a huge amount of money on slave pl plantations in the Caribbean and endowed vast sums of money. They've left his statue, but they've put a really, really big and elegant plaque saying this is in memory of all the people uh, who actually suffered so that we've got this money. And so I like the idea of looking these statues in the eye, putting two fingers up to them. I like walking through London and seeing all these blokes and thinking, you never thought I should have the vote, did you? You know, <laughs> and moving on, you know. <laughs> I like that, you know. I do have to say, and this is the other side of the argument, if you were to say, well, OK, so should we still think, you know, that we'd be happy with a statue of Goebbels or Hitler? And of course, I think, no. So somewhere in between this, mm. there's a boundary which I'm not entirely certain where it lies. Mm. Mm. But just always remember to say to these guys, you didn't think I had, should have the vote. And they quail in their bronze, you know? <laughs> <laughs>
So can I ask, though, some of the things that the battles that you have fought or are fighting, um, how, how do you win them? Because, for example, the first one, um, to appear to, for older women to appear on TV. So it's about the visibility of women in, in, in places. How, I mean, you're, you are still the exception. There are very few yeah. older women on TV. I think, I think there are more, but I did a television programme with um, a, a, another great-haired, uh, excellent... Um, actually denizen of Glasgow, Denise Minor, uh, uh, a novelist, and she did tweet before we went on this programme, I thought it used to be illegal to have two grey-haired women on the same telly <laughs> programme. <laughs> and, you know, but no, I think partly one does it by resilience. You know, when I said I was pleased I hadn't done any of this before I was 50-odd, you know, in the end it doesn't, it doesn't matter all that much to me. I've got a pretty thick skin, but I just won't be battered. Partly as being an academic, um, you know, because so when, you know, look, my job is arguing with students. And when students say something that I think is uh, probably wrong or possibly stupid or with which I disagree, I, I say, I don't agree with you. And that's, I mean, I've, I've done that for 40 years I've been teaching in a university and I'm not going to stop now, you know, even if it's some silly young lad you know, making stupid comments about um, what I smell like. Um, so um, it, the academy gives you a kind of, it, it programs you to do that. I also think a bit of sense of humour helps. You know, I think that, and again, I think that comes with age. I think when I was, you know, my 20s, I think I was cross about things the whole time. I was angry and I was outraged. And... You know, now I think it's a good idea that sometimes people should be cross, angry, and outraged because that's, in a way, um, is, is partly what changes things. But also, you know, it's, sometimes it's a good idea to have a laugh at it. Yeah. And I think there are some bits, you know, in terms of the world of sexism and misogyny, I think that there, you know, there are some bits that are so terrible that you have to call it out as just disgraceful. But, you know... <coughs> Some things that some men do, and I'm not tarring all men with the same brush, they're just silly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that, you know, I want, you know, they're ridiculous. So we should laugh at it as much as we try to um, stop it. Mm -hmm. In fact, laughing at it is quite a good way of stopping it, because they tend to feel a bit silly. I, I was intrigued, I was reading um, your, your attitude to sexist behaviour has changed as well, in the sense that in the 70s, I was just reading this in an article you've been interviewed. Um, you, you were actually not more tolerant, but um, it, it was perhaps it was more socially acceptable, perhaps that's what it was. Um, so, for example, in universities, um, you know, there'd be gropers and, you know, oglers and all the rest of it. And you, you tolerated them to an extent that perhaps you wouldn't today. Is that yeah. fair? I mean, I think, I think I've, my levels of tolerance and what I expect has changed. And it's certainly true that the kind of, the kind of world that students lived in um, in universities in the 70s is, is very, very different. And what I would now call the abuse of power, which in some ways it was, is something that we would now call out and say this should not happen. You know, the fact that, you know, let's say, and this is an invented example, you know, the, you know, the elderly Don who thinks it's fine to put his hand on your knee or whatever. And I think that's true. And uh, that kind of, the, conven the conventions of morality for all kinds of good reasons change. What I think is important to realise, and this is what my students, I think, find very hard to kind of get their heads around. Um, because if you tell them what life was like as a student in the 70s, and including how many, how few, how few women students there were at Cambridge, they think, God, you must have had a terrible time. You know, it must have been just awful. You know, they imagine that you were... You, well, you were sad the whole time, really. And you say, no, actually, what's really interesting is that I had the most wonderful uh, time when I was an undergrad. It was, you know, 
I think the best time of your life is usually the bit you're now in, or it is for me. But, um, uh, but anybody comes along and says to me, look at the sexist behaviour that you had to put up with. How did you manage it? Must have been awful. I can say, I can analyse it in those terms, intellectually, but actually, I had a great time, thank you. And I had agency, and I wasn't a victim. <laughs> no, not, not a victim. Not a victim. A I was not a victim. Or I did not... I mean, what, what, I, what I dislike is people telling people like me, you know, 20 years on, that we've got to go back, look at our experience, and realise that we were victims. I'm not going to be made into a victim. I think that what went on was... Definitely, you know, it was bad. So... So a hand just going up there, yes. If you speak up there, I think the microphone will come on there as well. And any other hands? Just, oh, look at this. I'm looking the wrong way, that's why. Okay. The lady there, and then we'll get some over here. Yes. Sorry, is this one working? It yes. is. I'm wondering how much you still believe in progress as you did when you were five. Because <laughs> women have got their power back and then lost it historically time and time again. I'm thinking of women regaining power in, the mon in their monasteries, nunneries, whatever, and then it being pushed back, and I'm thinking of great movements of, of women getting power back in the 19th, eight, sorry, 18th century, 17th century, and then getting pushed straight back, French Revolution, and so on, and so on, and so on. And I wonder which do you still believe in progress? <laughs> It depends what lens I, I take. I mean, uh, if I look at my own life and the way the opportunities for me, you know, have changed, uh, you know, over my 63 years, then it's very hard to put that in any kind of, under any definition, it has to be progress. I mean, now we may worry that there's not enough grey-haired old ladies on telly. Um, but um, 30 years ago, there wouldn't have been one. Right? So no, I, I, feel, I feel that I am living in a world that has come on. If you then say, right, OK, think wider than that, you know, you know try to foresee what happens, you know, after, maybe, you know, you know, when you're long, you know, underneath the earth, um, do I think that this, you know, things are going to go on going up? I'm, I'm really not sure that I do. I mean, I hope, I hope so. And I think that, you know, we can all point to the ways, for example, that periods of austerity um, often fall harder on women than they do on men, and that progress is, is perilous, and that, you know, it's, it's very easy to get... It's very easy to get, um, you know, as a keyboard warrior, enthusiastic about um, change, but it's harder to embed that so that it can't, so that it can't ever go back. And so, you know, I think that um, I, I'm, I'm less certain. Though for me, I'm, you know, I celebrate the fact that I've lived over the late 20th and early 21st century because I don't think there's, you know, there's never been a better time to be me. I think. <laughs> there was a, a lady right there, yes, with the glasses, yes. Hopefully, they might, yeah, there we are. Um, hi there, Mary. Hi. I was really interested in your book and also what you said today about the register of women's voices, their tone, and um, having a voice of authority. You were saying that women in leadership are told, as was Margaret Thatcher, that you need to lower your voice. I'm trying to do that right this minute, but it's Saturday morning, so that's probably not, or Saturday afternoon, not so difficult. Is that what women have to do? Do women have to learn to lower their voice, or do the listeners have to reattune what they expect to hear? Uh, I, basically, I think the listeners have to reattune, because I think the problem about... Um, the kind of leadership courses that we may or may not go on, is that basically they tend to suggest to women that women should pretend to be men, right? So that when you... So here you are, you're in the political sphere, you're, or you're lecturing in university or whatever, uh, and the way to claim authority 
is to be as close to being a man as you possibly could be. And you can see that in voice, you can see that in um, the outfits, the dress that, the, that is very often uh, adopted by female politicians. I mean, you know, Hillary Clinton and Angela Merkel regularly wear very sensible and practical trouser suits. And I'm sure partly it's, sense, it's good sense and practicality that's behind it. It also makes them, you know, they're dressing as close to looking like men as they possibly can. And I, mean, I think somehow one has, we have to learn to hear women's voices um, as speaking with expertise and authority. And even me, and I, an example that I've quite often told about myself, uh, but I think it shows how we're all implicated in this, is that, um, about 15, 20 years ago, I was on a plane, and there was that bit where um, the pilot speaks to you and says, we're well, going to be traveling at 35,000 feet and whatever, you know, and does the kind of pilot bit. And I was on this plane, and that notice was being made, and it was a woman's voice. For a split second, I said to myself, why is one of the cabin crew doing this notice? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, you know, I have been fighting all my life for women to be pilots and archbishops of Canterbury or whatever. And even I, my, my first instant reaction was that that's not the pilot. And you know, I then changed this into a celebration that we are now getting female pilots uh, on airplanes, but it was, it was a wake-up call for me, because I thought, you, you've just caught yourself out in falling into the traps that you criticised. Mm. In addition, if you could pass the microphone down to, yes, right there, and, uh, but there's a man just here, with glasses, yes, yeah. Bill, in fact. If you want to, the microphone should come on for you first. Oh, it's on, sorry, I beg yeah. your pardon, I thought you were looking for someone else. <laughs> Um, for the last couple of years, we've been talking a lot about fake news, but I think that Professor Beard has spent her life um, questioning fake news in, in history. How, would, how do you establish a fact in, 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 in history? Would you like to say something about that, please? Thank you. It's extremely difficult. I mean, I think that in a, in a way, I don't trade much in facts. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be happy if somebody says that Julius Caesar was murdered in 43 BC uh, rather than 44 BC when he was murdered. That's true. Um, but I, what I'm trying to do with my students is to see that the facts, there are far fewer facts in the distant past than we would like to think. Um, and... Often, I think, the area of history I work in, people have rather crudified the idea of a fact. And so I will find my students come up and say, um, well, look, I would, you know, Nero was a bad emperor. Fact. And you say, well, OK, was Tony Blair a good prime minister? And then they say, oh, well, that's difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, some things he did. I said, right, let's try and think about all the ways that we debate our own political, historical world and that we see that there are hundreds of different perspectives. And let's try and think as hard as we can about how we can uh, reflect those debates back into antiquity. Now, uh, uh, so I think in some ways... It's recognising that news and fake news are always two sides of the same coin. And, say, and then saying, so what difference does that make uh, when you think about that historically? In some ways, fake news has done, you know, has done the world of good for historical sophistication, actually. Oh, there's a challenge there. Yes. Um, I'm Annie. I work uh, in the charity sector at the moment. That was a long, long time ago. I attempted to pass as an academic. Um, and I really would be interested in your thoughts um, connecting with what you said about the silencing of women, um, about it seems to me an increasingly kind of fraught and angry debate uh, in, in the academy about no platforming. Yeah, I mean, I think this is quite, again, it's quite difficult. I think that, you know, speaking as somebody whose day job is in university, um, it, it frankly isn't what I see around me 
uh, in Cambridge all the time. I mean, I do, you know, but I, I, you know, I also read stories of, of, uh, of key, and I think in some ways, um, you know, unacceptable examples of this. But, you know, people, I think it's very easy to get the impression that the university sector in the United Kingdom is absolutely riven with problems of no platforming, you know, and actually I haven't, I haven't spotted that with my own eyes. Um, uh, and I think it, it does provide, it provides a very good, um, a very good case study for any journalist of any political persuasion to, you know, really get in and say, you know, well, the, are these the snowflake generation or whatever? Now, I, I don't think it's entirely invented. And, you know, my own view is very straightforward that, um, that I, I will, and I want my students to listen to every kind of opposing view they legally can listen to and, and learn how to argue with it. Now, of course we know there's a problem because you know, certainly on some of the far right of this debate, you, you get people saying free speech counts as everything. Well, actually, most of us do not think that um, free speech includes the right to go and stir up hatred against Muslims um, or any other minority or majority group. And so again, you know, it's a bit like those statues. You know, quite where you draw the line, is, I think, is bound to be contested. But uh, I, uh, I want my students to listen to and engage with and show how wrong some of the people with whom they rightly disagree are cogently and learn to be plausible in arguing and learn to be powerful in argument and to keep their ears open and um, not to get in an echo chamber. You know, Twitter is a bit of an echo chamber. You know, I think that you know, your followers tend to agree with you because that's why they're your followers. Um, and they, um, uh, and there is a kind of degree of, of self-righteousness which can come on both sides. And the word I notice, um, and I think it, it kind of shows a bit of that sort of echo chamber mentality, is that people sometimes say about me when I've said something with which they don't, dis with which they don't agree in my kind of group, I'm very disappointed in Mary Beard. <laughs> Bloody hell, we disagree, right? You don't have to make that a moral failing on my <laughs> part. We can actually disagree uh, fervently on one thing. We might agree on a lot of others. So I, I, I bridle every time I see her. I'm very disappointed. I, I recognise that. So, yes, woman in the front row there, yes. Uh, yes? Um, as a follower of you on Twitter, I've always very much enjoyed... Um, listening to what you've got to say about women in power. I wonder, Professor Beard, if I can tempt you to talk a little bit about men and power, because in the world I come from, which is diplomacy and international affairs, there's a lot of concern about the rise of the strong man, the Putins, Trumps, Erdogan's, Orbans, what's happening in Saudi Arabia, North Korea, and so on. And actually, it strikes me that the end of the Republic in Rome, the Roman Empire and so on, tells one a great deal about strong men and power and what happens to politics with it. And I'd be very interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I don't mean to, um, you know, to get against my own commercial interest to recommend somebody else's book, but Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's book um, on why we should all be feminists or something, I think she's extremely good on, um, on the male aspect of this. The, you know, I mean, we can give it the, the kind of shorthand toxic masculinity, but she says, you know, you only have to go to a school playground to see, you know, the little boy falls down, and still people will say, don't cry, you know? You know and they still say, big boys don't cry. And, and actually, if you're kind of thinking about, you know, how the world would be run better, it would be run much better if little boys were allowed to cry and, and guys like, you know, Trump and Putin, whatever, and I'm sure we could name some politicians in 
the United Kingdom too, uh, you know, didn't think of kind of power as, well, you know, something which was kind of weaponized for them and which they stood to lose everything by if they didn't get what they wanted. And there's, I think that feminism always, although it hasn't always stressed it, but uh, for me at the root of it has always been, you know, it's, it's as much empowering women as it's, you know, it's letting some, it's letting men off the hook a bit, you know? It's allowing them not to be like that. And it's sort of calling out these guys who, um, uh, who I think are probably, you know, trapped in that kind of masculinity, really. I mean, I'd like to think that if Donald Trump could think very hard, he wouldn't like to be Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> we should let him not be Donald Trump. <laughs> There's hands going up ever here. Yes, young woman, just there, indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Marcy Wynne Stanley. I'm a second year um, classical literature and civilization student at the University of Birmingham. Um, one of my main interests in the ancient world is kind of women's voices, the power of underrepresented groups, whether it's slaves, minorities in any sense. But I'm also interested in that in our own world. Um, and after university, I want to go into politics. Um, so women and power was something that really um, affected me, and I think it's the fav my favourite book of all time. Um, oh, so um, I just wanted to ask, though, um, I think already um, in my re own research, even though I'm less than halfway through my degree, um, there's been kind of, at some points, dismissal by some men of kind of the whole field of studying women and power, um, that somehow looking at uh, women in the ancient world through um, a kind of contemporary feminist lens is wrong, anachronistic, and not valid. I was just wondering kind of whether you could give me your thoughts on that. What would be a constructive response to some men who say that? Um, well, I, at the widest level, I'd say, look, history is all about looking at the past through our eyes. You know, I don't, I don't think that... Uh, the ultimate aim of history is to um, find out exactly how it really was. I'm not saying we should not be interested in that at all, but I think the best historians always have been those who have had a dialogue between that and what we, and, and our, own, our own world. You know, you can look in the classical world that the study of the... Um, of the rise of autocracy in Rome uh, was really reinvigorated in the late 30s for quite obvious reasons, uh, just by looking around at what was happening in Europe. And you know, I've lived, again, this is another kind of revolution I've lived through, in which, you know, when, when I was an undergraduate, actually, we used to occasionally, in the summer term, do an essay on women, because it wasn't, you know, it's what you did in the summer term when it didn't really matter. Right? And now, it's not, it, it's that, not that women in the ancient world seem to me to be important, of course they are, it's the whole way that gender operates. And I mean, I think I would say to them, look, a, a gendered approach to ancient history has revolutionized our understanding of how the men we see in ancient literature are presented. And again, it's about feminism always being bifocal. And you know, if anybody wants to come to me and say, you know, feminist theory has not made our picture of the ancient world richer, more sophisticated, um, brought, brought all kinds of issues into strong relief. Look, I didn't notice Penelope being shut up by Telemachus. When I was an undergraduate, I just thought, oh, probably it's the kind of weird things that happen a long, very long time ago. And so it makes you see different things. Uh, it's not necessarily right. You know, there isn't, you know, it's not that we're going to kind of get history finished once we've given it a feminist tinge. But we are going to, it, it's going to enrich what we see. Um, and I would just tell them to shut up, really. <laughs> <laughs> 
couple of comments on Facebook, by the way. Just uh, an interesting one about um, uh, a woman who's saying that um, she's a teacher and she, when she talks to boys about statistics, they don't think she's being truthful or they don't give her authority, I think is what she's saying. So just, a, just an observation. She also questions about the Me Too movement. Well, a couple of hands here. We'll just take questions. Yes, the young woman right there. Okay. Uh, the microphone should come on, yes, that's it. Um, okay, first off, sorry for my voice. I'm just a bit all over the place. Um, so recently, obviously, we've been hearing a lot about the Brett Kavanaugh case, and you were talking earlier about silencing women and um, how they're sort of portrayed in the media. And um, a lot of um, press, both here and in the US, were talking about these women being hysterical when they were confronting um, confronting these uh, these Ma like these men in suits and um, and how they were so unsophisticated and they weren't put together and um, thinking about the silencing women um, when women do speak out it's about how men then well men and women portray um, what they're saying and I'm sort of trying to get your opinion on um, not just that case but sort of um, when women do speak out, how they're then, um, how they're then spoken about further. Sense. I mean, a, a good example of that is, I mean, a, a, everybody I think ought to um, examine carefully the the verb to whine, <laughs> because it's something that no man is accused of, and women regularly are. I, I did actually do. That's not quite true. Premier League football play, football managers are often accused of whining. I don't know why that is. But otherwise, you, you do get in, uh, you get a position in which women's attempts to speak out, successful attempts to speak out, are then dismissed by using a particular kind of verb uh, uh, to describe their interventions. That, and that is true uh, right back to antiquity as well. You know, uh, it, women's voices in the Roman in the Roman period were often described as animal voices. They they yelp um, or they bark, and you still find that Henry James, uh, you know, in the late nineteenth century, is still saying the voices of women you know, pollute political discourse. So you don't. What that means is you don't have to listen to them. I mean, I thought in the the Kavanaugh case. Uh, I started off thinking, well, maybe I do feel a bit awkward about what happened 37 years ago when the guy was 17, somehow being now seen as, uh, as the breaking point here. What was very interesting is that I somewhat had to eat my words because in his response to those allegations, Whatever you think of the allegations, the response to his allegations, in my, his response to the allegations, in my view, meant that he displayed his unsuitability for the post. And I think a lot of women felt that, um, though the upshot was not quite as we wanted to. And it, it will be interesting to see how that story gets uh, replayed and narrativized. You know, who's, who is going to seem the narrative winner in the long run. Mm. I think we don't know that yet. Yes, indeed. Can I ask you a couple of political questions? I'm just conscious we're coming to the end. And, uh, political yeah. questions. Well, well, well it's a true. festival of <laughs> politics, so... I, 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 I <laughs> pick you up a... Uh, 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 um, well, we're on a political subject, but uh, a couple of points you made about... Um, you said that your, your own popularity is because people like an expert. Um, but, of course, we're, we're in a period where... Well, Michael Gove famously said <laughs> that, you know... It's the, the, the British public don't want to hear any more experts, thank you very much, yeah. in the context of the Brexit referendum yeah. in particular. Yeah. So do you think there is, I mean, it's going back to this issue about truth and yeah. you know, fake news. What is the role of the expert and do politics, does politics need more uh, expertise? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that we just have to, we, we have to speak out in support of expertise. Now, I think the difficulty is, again, we, we're, we're trying to do two things. And um, one is, you know, and I'm now going back to a, basically an ancient democratic argument here, that in some ways everybody's an expert in politics. What, you know, being a citizen um, is being a political being. And people sometimes attack me and other 
people who, when they appear on Question Time, saying, well, you're a classicist. They say, stick to your own subject, right? And you have to say, politics is everybody's subject. We're all experts in politics. Um, and you know, what we want is the citizen to speak out. That, and I think that's absolutely true. At the same time, and again, another ancient democratic argument, is the problem is democracy isn't worth a hill of beans if the democratic citizen does not get access to correct information. So the, uh, democracy is not defined by putting a vote in a ballot box solely. That is a kind of part of it, certainly a part of it, but it's not the be-all and end-all. Democracy is about the well-informed voter putting his or her vote in the ballot box. Now, when you say that, people often say, oh, so you're saying that um, people who voted for Brexit were stupid. I'm not saying that whatsoever. I'm saying that we have reached a position in which the referendum on both sides was an example of that, uh, the Brexit referendum, um, where we have forgotten the importance of proper, accurate, and expert information. And if there was a, if there was a, a real democratic tragedy in the Brexit referendum, it was that 99% of us, and I'm including me, whatever we thought, did not vote with full information. Most of us can still not actually um, explain the difference between um, uh, the customs union and the single market. And it's absolutely crucial. And uh, perhaps my final question to end, this, this parliament is uh, the, the leaders of the two biggest parties are women. Nicola Sturgeon, who stands, sits there, and Ruth Davidson, who normally sits here. And of course, we have a woman prime minister, Theresa May. Now, do you see her, with, from your political perspective, do you see her as a conservative, or do you see her as a woman prime minister? So when she, when she danced onto the stage, <laughs> oh, okay. well, as she danced yeah. onto the stage, yeah. she was half commended yeah. for that, yeah. for the courage of that, and half mocked. Yes. So what did you see? I am afraid I thought she has been advised by her PR people that to take a little self-irony at her previous dancing out, outing would be a very good idea. Um, I would have felt happier with it if I felt she'd felt happy with it. <laughs> you know, I mean, nice idea. I don't, you know, d dance all she likes. I love her shoes, you know, and I think, why the hell not? You know, I think, why the hell not? Uh, my unease was that, you, you know, I just, I pictured this back room thinking, okay, now last year, Mrs. May's speech was a bit of a disaster. So what are we going to do this year? And then somebody had an idea. Now, I know. Hey, look, what about dancing? Because it was, that, you know, and, and so the whole thing seemed to me, in, in two senses of the word, extremely choreographed. And I think what you, you know, what I want to hear, and this is, I, I want to hear my elected representatives, even if I've not voted for them, talking to me in what they want to say. I mean, I still, you know, I'm still the person who feels kind of slightly anxious when I kind of realise all their speeches are written for them. You know, and we, you know, and 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 their articles in newspapers. You know, you can see an article signed, whatever kind of front bench spokesperson, you know, in whatever Sunday newspaper. And, you know, in what sense do we think that's by that person? And so, uh, you know, I would kind of, I would like to, you know, de-choreograph, de-PR and de-sloganise politics, but it's probably a bit late. <laughs> Mary Beer, can I say thank you very much? In fact, I want to say thank you to everybody here for coming along and for supporting the Festival of Politics, for your questions uh, and your interest in politics, future politicians in the audience, it's good to see. Um, thank you very much also to the Open University for supporting this event. Uh, afterwards, if you, there's other events on in the building, but if you want to go down, Mary will be signing copies of her book in the garden lobby, uh, which I'm sure she'd welcome to see more of you and any further questions you can put to her then. But could I ask you to join me in thanking our guest today, Dame Professor Mary Beard.